Hey y'all, Katie here with Mom Nation, and welcome to another episode of Our Love Story. We know being in a relationship is hard, so Diana Isel, Certified Couples Counselor, and I talk through different tips and tricks to help you navigate your relationship and get through everyday life. While you're here on your favorite podcast platform, please subscribe to our channel, or if you'd like to visit us on YouTube and watch the video, our handle is Mom Nation USA. We hope you enjoy the show. Good morning, Mom Nation. It is I, Katie, your founder, and I am here on another lovely Friday with our very favorite couples counselor, Diana Eisel. Welcome, Diana. Good morning. How are you today? I'm great. How are you? Doing awesome. For those of you who are out there who might not know who we are or who Diana is, most importantly, Diana, can you share just a little bit about you and why are we doing this show on a monthly basis? Absolutely. I am a licensed associate marriage and family therapist. So I specialize in couples counseling. I'm right here, um, right on the border of Mesa and Gilbert. So the reason we do this show is to take some of those sometimes anonymous, sometimes not questions that we get on Mom Nation, all things relationships related. I'm here to take some of those issues and help talk them through with you guys to give you somewhat of an objective observation and kind of lead you towards a direction for healing or try to at least get some answers to some of your questions. Yeah, super helpful. Thank you for being here with us, Diana. I love this show because I see so many posts out there in mom nation land that are, I mean, being a couple is hard. Being married is hard. Being in a relationship is hard. Even if it's like rainbows and butterflies, most of the time, it still takes work to get the rainbows and butterflies, right? Like, am I right? And it's not always, (laughs) even when it is. Exactly. Not always the case. And that's okay. That's healthy too. Exactly. So we're here once a month. It's on a Friday. Usually always it's always on Friday. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And we are talking through, like, like Diana said, a lot of times we're using posts in the group just to talk through those. In fact, today we have one, it came out this morning and I saw it and I was like, I sent it over to Diana and I was like, Oh my gosh, this is a really good one. I feel like it would be great to talk through Um, There are a couple questions on this post, so we'll get right to it. But while you are at it, if you are listening to the podcast on Mom Nation Talk Radio, if you're listening to this podcast on your favorite podcast platform, please subscribe to our channel, download our episodes. You'll get notifications of our new shows, and it will really, really help us get this very important information out to the moms that need to hear it. If you would rather watch the video, hop on over to our YouTube channel, which is at Mom Nation USA. That is our handle. And we have a special playlist just for Diana, and it is called Our Love Story. So hop on over there and check us out. I'm going to pull this um, post up here. Let me share my screen. All right. So I feel like there's like a really long answer to this question. So let's start with the first one. Um, This particular poster posted anonymously said that her sister came to her in confidence because she's having marital issues. And there seems like a major, uh, which these issues seem like major reasons to get divorced. So her question is, is will therapy help in this or should we just head to the divorce attorney? Is that the best way to go? So question number one, Diana, Her spouse has a really bad spending habit and will spend more than they have. We've heard this before. They're always struggling financially, but he bought a brand new car, will spend hundreds on dinner and literally anything that he wants. My sister is always trying to save, but can't get ahead, even though she's the breadwinner. He only has odd jobs and works as waitstaff part time. She finally opened up a secret account, but he's constantly accusing her of having separate accounts and she's scared. What's your take? Well, there's a couple of things going on here. First, I would like to, you know, address your question before reading question number one, which is, do we head straight for the divorce papers or do we go to counseling? I don't think there's any cut or dry answer for that. I do feel that therapy can be helpful if both parties are willing participants um, and are willing to take some accountability for their role in whatever the issues are. If you only have one party that's a willing participant, but you're not quite ready to call it quits, I definitely would recommend individual counseling anyway to help you cope with some of those things um, as well. Um, In this case, it does sound like there's opportunity for um, 
communication clearly um but i would also want to know some of the the backstory on this like how long has this been going on is this something recent is this like something that's always been happening because that means a lot it matters right if it's something that's like more recent i would wonder like has there been some sort of life event some sort of stressor that has happened that has changed his behavior or perhaps changed her behavior or the way that she's looking at it has this always been a thing has this just been like part of their system and now she's like you know what i'm really tired of it i don't want to deal with it anymore um so i guess i would need a little bit more information about that but certainly money is one of the top reasons that couples do have conflict. So it's not uncommon to have, you know, conflict about money. Um, but I guess I would need a little bit more context, a little bit more information as to why that's happening um, and find out a little bit more about what their relationship dynamics are. But that certainly does sound very problematic and would be very beneficial for them to talk through together. Absolutely. And I like what you said in the beginning about, hey, get your own counselor. And, you know, my experience with marriage counseling with, with my spouse is that, yeah, it's, I, I kind of feel like it's, and you tell me if I'm right, or if that's the experience of most people, I kind of feel like going to, straight to marriage counseling might be putting the cart before the horse. If you're not figuring out what's going on with you first, because then how can you be vulnerable? Like you need to be, how can you be clear? Like you need to be when you're trying to communicate with another party, if you're still kind of stuffing all of your junk down down low as well. I mean, can you speak to that a little bit? Absolutely. I think it'd be beneficial either way. I find uh, a lot of times when I'm seeing couples the first few times and I start to identify some patterns or some distorted thought processes in one or both of them, that's when I can get a better picture of, oh, this is why this is becoming so problematic because you have, you're hearing this particular thing, you're hearing this particular thing why do you hear those things so differently? What are your life experiences that are contributing to that? And then I'll refer out for individual counseling to complement the couple's counseling. Sometimes when you go to individual counseling, it's hard to decipher like, what am I exactly talking about? Like, what, what am I trying to get to? What is the root of what I'm trying to get to? Because you may not fully understand uh, because a lot of times in couples conflict, we look for someone to blame. We look for somewhere to point the finger like, this is you that's doing this. This is me that's doing this. Um, we're looking for, we're basically playing the blame hot potato game and that's not going to get us anywhere. So I do feel like it's beneficial to get the individual therapy, but I feel like it can certainly happen three, four sessions into marriage or couples counseling to identify that like, yeah, there does seem to be some other things that have happened from your past that are contributing to this issue. How do you feel about, you know, digging into that on is good. I think it's helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Totally agree. Um, so many questions about this first question. I'm like, gee, I'm looking at the clock and I'm like, are we going to get through all three? I don't know. Cause I like to talk. Um, as far as the, the car, I'm thinking to myself, like you said, has this always been a problem? How long has this been going on? Is she enabling this type of behavior and not communicating, maybe not digging her heels in the sand and saying, hey, wait a minute, you know, I don't really agree with those purchases because I would think unless you buy a car for cash, she would have had to have been a part of that pre-qualification process, um, you know, to sign, to get a loan if he's only doing odd jobs and, and you know, wait staffing mm -hmm. here and there and she's the breadwinner. I, I mean, that, that would be my assumption. Again, it's just an assumption, um, but let's just consider that assumption is true. So if you're enabling, 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 and then finally, and I'm not saying she is, but maybe, you know, um, and then finally you want to stop doing that. How do you have that conversation with, with your spouse? What are your tips for that? Well, you're essentially changing the system now. You're changing the rules, right? So you've decided that there's a boundary that may or may not have been clearly articulated, but it has certainly been crossed at this point. So now having to double back and explain why this is my boundary and this is how you've crossed it can be really tricky. Um, and if it, it's a very, um, it's a very careful process in which you want to get to a solution and you don't want the other person to feel defensive about what they're doing, um, right. especially if they're completely unaware of what that boundary was. So we've had this, you know, discussion before on a previous podcast about boundaries. If you set a boundary or set an expectation, but you don't articulate it and the other person crosses it, it's not really their fault right. um, because they didn't even know it was there. So in this case with the car, again, I, I think I would need a little bit more information, but has this always been the way that it is? Like, has this always been where they make independent purchases from each other? Right. Has this always been where, you know, does he have 
money in a separate savings account that I don't know that he inherited or had from a, an, another job or something um, where the money is coming from. Is it coming from her account? And further down in that question, um, it kind of looked like he was reacting to her having a separate account. So obviously he's noticing. So right. I'm assuming maybe that they have a joint account. So he's noticing that not as much money is in there. So I guess I would need to know a little bit more about the history of money in their relationship um, to determine if those boundaries have been set previously. Um, and if it's how tricky it's going to be to set those now and to change the rules. Again, we've said this before in previous podcasts, when you're setting boundaries, the ones that protest the most are the ones that benefited the most from you not having any. Yeah. So if she is going to attempt to set those boundaries with him about spending, whether it be types of purchases or whatever, um, and there's a, a, a protest, you know, that's a, a pretty good indication that he was benefiting from her either enabling or not saying anything or not having any of those boundaries. You know what I mean? So that will be very telling when they do have a conversation, if they have a conversation about it, um, how he feels about her and her expectations and the relationship regarding money. And I wonder how, and, and again, without having, you know, these people in front of us, I guess we'll never know the answers, but I wonder how that dynamic is, you know, is he, do you think that he's kind of feeling like, okay, if I can be in control of the money, even though I don't make it, then he still is kind of having some sort of power play there, some sort of like position of dominance there. It's, it's very possible um, because socially in our society, um, it's definitely uh, a kick to the ego gut for a guy if the wife is the breadwinner and she's making the majority of the money. Um, and for some men, that makes them very uncomfortable. So they will try to grasp at whatever else they can in the relationship to try to assert some sort of control or some sort of power. So that is certainly possible. Yeah. Um, what What do you, over over the course of time and, and taking on as many clients as you've, you've had and having that experience, what do you attribute the problem to be or where where do people who have spending issues when they don't have enough to spend like where does that come from Ooh, well i think we talked about this in a previous podcast it could either come from um a growing up without having all of the means without having all the things that they need um struggling financially growing up whether it be um, growing up um, in poverty or growing up in, in some other ways in which finances were a struggle for the primary parents. Um, or it could be the exact opposite, which is I never really had to worry about budgeting or anything like that. I just always had money to spend. Mom and dad, whoever the caregivers are, made sure that I had money to spend. So I didn't really learn how to be fiscally responsible. Um, so it really can come from from either direction. But generally, um, those types of behaviors aren't just about money. There's usually something else in there that's involved. Do you think that people find comfort in being financially strapped if that's the pattern they've been running in? Oh, absolutely. Um, there's definitely psychology behind um, familiarity, being comfortable. You see it in trauma, even though we know that certain types of people are bad for us. We tend to gravitate towards those people because it feels familiar. It feels very comfortable um, to even take it to an extreme example of people who have been incarcerated. You know, they, they come out and they're sort of like, don't know what to do because they've been living a certain type of life while they've been incarcerated. So they find comfort back in what? Back to what they were doing before or something more similar because that's familiar and that's comfortable. They know that's probably not the best choice, um, but it's so hard to make a, a mental swap and say like, oh, I want something different. This is how I'm going to do it. When you have literally no experience or no instructions on how to do that. So absolutely, we do find comfort in things that are unhealthy for us. All right. Anything more to add on question number one? We covered most of it. Unless I think we did. I think we did. So our answer is try therapy before the divorce route on answer number one. Yeah. Because it could be just a matter of having a good, clear conversation. I mean, again, we don't know these people. We don't know um, all of the factors surrounding it. But I mean, have you ever seen that happen? 
where in a session, the married couple just has a good, clear, vulnerable conversation and it really is a game changer? Oh, absolutely. It typically takes a few, at least a few sessions to get someone to be vulnerable enough to open up because again, they've probably learned in prior experiences that being vulnerable and opening up is not safe. Um, so creating that safe space for them to do that is critical and moving forward in healing and being able to set those healthy relationship boundaries and being able to talk and creating the emotional safety that's just necessary in every relationship. Yeah. Yeah. Totally agree with that. All right. Next question. You ready? Number two, she's desperately wanted kids her entire life, but first marriage didn't work out. I have a camera right in front of me. So that's why I'm like doing this. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, the first marriage didn't work out for a good reason. She's now 38 and her new spouse promised he wanted kids, even though he has two from different, ba two from two different baby mamas and they're all grown up. He recently said he was going to get a vasectomy because he no longer wants kids. My sister is crushed and thinks she should stay with him because she's too old to get remarried and have kids. man that situation i know i know well um i know this this part always sounds super unhelpful on the listening side but how long has this been going on like how long have they been married how long have they been together was there a conversation of you know once we get to these ages we're probably just going to say the kids that we have or are plenty or enough um was that conversation had i don't know um, was the conversation about having a vasectomy, was that said in a conflict? Was that said to like, to poke? Was that said to agitate? Um, was that coming from an emotionally vulnerable place? Is that coming from a place of fear? Man, I'm getting older. I don't know if I can start all over again with another yeah. kid. Um, without like knowing where that message is coming from, I hear her hurt and I'll be the first to validate it because that's a really tricky and tough position to be in because she does want to have more kids. And it sounds like she was under the assumption that they were going to have more kids. But I really yeah. think that this has to go back to what was the initial conversation about this and what was the agreement that had been come to. And if there wasn't one, then how can we do that now? so that both parties feel like they've got what they needed out of it. And digging a little bit more into that comment, like hmm, the vasectomy comment, is that, again, was that a very reactive comment and an argument to try to make a dig at her? Was that out of fear? Um, what, where was that coming from? Um, and what led up to that comment? So I think I would like to know a little bit more about where he was coming from in that position. And I think, if she can sit down with him and have that conversation, that would probably be my first question. It's like, tell me where you're coming from with that. Like judgment free zone here, but where are you coming from with that comment? Like, yeah. do you feel like starting over at this point, it's just going to be too much. Do you feel like you don't want any more kids? Is it a financial thing? Is it like, where are you coming from so that I can level with you and validate where you're coming from so that we can get on the same page here? You know what I mean? But it seems like, there's no real clear, where did that come from statement? Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree with you. Do you see this a lot? I wouldn't say a lot, um, but I do see it sometimes um, for people who are on their, like their second marriages um, mm -hmm. who want to have more kids. Um, and generally I let them know, like have an agreement. You know, if you get to this point and it hasn't happened, then are you okay with that? And can you, um, if, if you are beyond that point and you've agreed that you guys aren't going to have kids, let's go ahead and move through that grief process, right? Especially for the partner that really did want to have another child. Um, but holding on to that agreement is important unless they are both open to negotiation. Um, but otherwise, starting that grief process um, together is really, really validating and really important for the partner that perhaps is cool with it, that maybe didn't want to as much as the other parent did. Mm -hmm. um, but that's really important to allow them to grieve and, and, and validate their feelings in that. Um, but I don't feel like this is a super uncommon thing. But what is what tends to be more uncommon is having the conversation about what does that timeline look like? Not just, oh, yeah, if we get married, like, I definitely want to have at least one more kid. Oh, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. And then five years later, it's like, mm, well, I don't yeah. know anymore. They weren't on the same page. So right. we've talked about this in previous podcasts and I, and I really loved this conversation. So I just want to briefly have it again. When, when we're talking about sort of like 
I don't know, interviewing our person before we start really getting serious or we start talking marriage or whatever. Um, you have suggested in, in the past that if this is an important topic, this be on the table, like straight away. Absolutely. So what, how can we, um, what kind of tips can we give to, to moms out there that, or ladies out there that might be in this position? Maybe they're, you know, in the honeymoon phase, they've found that new love. They're talking about getting more serious. Like how does that conversation come up without being weird? Well, being confident in what you're asking for or what you're trying to say is really important. So go into it with the mindset of like, I know what I'm asking for. I'm really confident about what I'm asking for. Um, and that's going to be really important in how the rest of the conversation goes. Describing the issue right off the bat from a very non-judgmental place is a really good next step. So being very judgment, non-judgmental and saying this is this is where this is the situation right now. Like. I have two kids, um, you know, the plan was I, I, I kind of wanted to have three kids by the time I was whatever age. This is just, these are just the facts. This is kind of what I had planned on, you know what I mean? And then moving into how you feel about that. Like, I feel like I would really like to have another child in the next two years or so. I would really want to hear what your thoughts are on that and where you're at. You know, you're not starting from anything that starts with you. You're not inciting anything that could make someone become defensive. You're just saying, these are the facts. This is how I feel about it. What do you think? You know what I mean? Um, and encourage and then, them to share the same facts exactly. back. Absolutely. And then reinforcing after they do that, after they've shared their viewpoint with you, reinforcing that like, no, I really appreciate your perspective. Like, I think that's really important you know, to, to validate the other person's perspective, it makes them feel heard as well. And then we go into finding the solution. Okay. So then what do we do? Mm -hmm. You know, how do we find a really good compromise? I like what you said about being confident in your thoughts and feelings and the facts of the, the situation on your end, because how often, I mean, I can think of so many times just in my life, whether it be a spouse or a friend or my parents or whatever, where I've kind of gone along with what they wanted, even though it wasn't really what I wanted. And I thought, well, it's just better to either keep the peace or, you know, be harmonious, or maybe what I want is like weird. And, you know, I shouldn't be asking for that only to be resentful in the past. Mm -hmm. do you how, like, how often do you see that, you know, where people are, are like agreeable and they go along, mm -hmm. go along, go along only to be totally resentful. So like the moral of the story is, is be true to yourself, be clear, have the confidence to rise up and, and state your facts. I mean, would you say that's probably the best way of handling it? Well, I see that all the time, all the time. And that's when we go back to the conversation about changing the system. Mm. So the other person is like, wait a second, like you're not cool doing all the housework all the time. That's weird. <laughs> you've been you've doing been it for five years, time, yeah. right? You've been yeah. doing it the whole time. Now all of a sudden it's a problem. That's weird. You know, like, it seems like that's just like a really silly example, but I see it all the time, all the time. And then that other partner becomes super resentful. Like, why should I have to be cleaning? Well, nobody said that you should, but did you make it clear that this is what your expectation is before we've compounded five years worth of resentment? Right. And now we've got to go back five years and start digging ourselves out of that resentment hole, you know, instead of addressing it earlier on. Um, it's really hard to identify though, Katie, when you are doing those people pleasing behaviors and why you're doing it. Yeah. Uh, Cause that tends to come from a place of like high functioning anxiety or potentially some other anxiety disorder, um, that we don't even realize that we're doing it. Mm -hmm. So in an attempt to avoid, uh, judgment or trauma or rejection or abandonment, all of these things that could have existed in someone's traumatic past are all reasons that we people please, but we don't always realize that we do it. Right. Right. But, and, and can't that cause other problems too? Like, well, you've been lying to me about not loving to clean the house for the last five years. Like, what are you, what else are you lying to me about? now? You know, or, or yeah. What else is there that you're not being forthcoming about or clear or honest about? And I kind of feel like that could cause conflicts as well. Absolutely. I see it all the time. It sort of opens up Pandora's box about, okay, well, now that we've smoothed that over also, I don't like when this happens or when you do this. And it's like, yeah. you know, it sometimes makes the other par partner feel blindsided. They didn't really see that coming. You know what I mean? 
Absolutely. And it's even worse when whomever, you know, partner A, let's say partner A is the one with the resentment and then they go to mom and complain to mom, for the, you know, and then pull mom into it. And now they, they've got people on their side for their resentment. And then it just causes this big, huge blow up. So honesty is the best policy, people. That's what I'm hearing Diana say. And keep non-objective parties out of it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We had a whole podcast on that. Uh-huh. I think last time. Yeah. Last month. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, Any more to add on number two? No, I think we're good. All right. Let's do number three. So question number three is he's always accusing her of cheating. Tonight she came over to drop her dog off so I can pet sit. And we chatted for maybe an hour. No idea. I, oh yeah, no idea. He was blowing up her phone and mine too. When she left, she called and he just started yelling, saying she's a cheater. He even accuses her of wanting to cheat with his kid's friends, 12 years old, and accusing her of wanting to be with his brothers. She just talks to somebody else and she's called a cheater. That sounds like a really big one. Yeah. Um, For a couple of reasons. One, um, what comes to mind for me is people who are typically insecure or blaming or accusing someone of having a relationship outside of their relationship, uh, a lot of times tends to be projecting. Um, so they've, they've engaged in that behavior before, or they're doing it now, um, and they've become very insecure. Um, and so they're projecting that behavior onto somebody else, even if they really don't have any evidence to back that up. Um, this also sounds like it's coming from a place of fear, um, coming from a place of instability. Mm-hmm. Um, I would be, I I'd be, I'm not, I'm not a betting girl because I like my money where I can see it in my closet, but I would be willing to bet that he has some, some trauma in his past surrounding uh, abandonment and rejection, um, some sort of attachment injury there um, that's sort of leading him down this path. Um, So I would definitely be more curious about some of his history there. Um, But that is a clear uh, boundary in the relationship that's being violated to accuse someone of stepping outside the relationship. If their current relationship rules are that we don't do that. I mean, if there's rules that stating otherwise, then it gets a little bit murkier, but I would have to assume that those are the rules of the relationship. So projecting is one of the things that seems to be kind of problematic. Um, The issue with her being attracted to, you know, a minor boy's friends, um, seems very, um, extra, I guess. That is is extra. Yeah. It it doesn't seem, um, logical and it doesn't seem, it doesn't seem like it's rooted in any real reality. Um, unless there's more to these individuals that I just don't know. And there's some sort of, you know, sexual abuse history or trauma or something happening there. I was just going to say. Because if there is sexual abuse or trauma on either side, um, if it was for him, for example, it might be coming up as as like a, as a trauma response for him um, as a trigger, because maybe he was abused around the same age that the boy is at now. Or if he has awareness that that has happened to her, he could be using that against her to weaponize that to make her feel shame and to make her feel guilt for things that have happened to her in her past that were not her fault. Um, So I would definitely want to dig in more on where that's coming from uh, because if it's the latter, um, that that's very problematic. If we're using our partner's trauma, trauma against them because we're not getting what we want or need out of their relationship, um, there's other healthier ways to do that. So those are the two big things that come to mind as an issue with this, with this particular um, point is projection and how potential past traumas are either being triggered or they're being used um, against her to kind of get the upper hand here. I totally agree. How in therapy, because again, the, the overall blanket blanket question is therapy or divorce court. So in therapy, for example, uh, what kind of conversation would come up here? Like what, what kind of, and, and I don't know if I'm asking the right question here, but like, how would you go about navigating a situation like this? 
Well, I do learn a lot through the intake packet. And that's something that I read before the clients even walk into my office. So I do a general intake. So that tells me about how they grew up, um, what their life was like with their parents, who their social supports are. I get a really good snapshot of who they are. But then I also administer an ACEs test which is Adverse Childhood Experiences Survey. So that tells me experiences that someone has had regarding um, divorce, uh, parental drug abuse, um, sexual abuse, trauma, um, whether it be emotional, physical, sexual, um, it covers all of those things and it gives a score. So obviously the higher the score, the more of those things that's happened. So that gives me a really good idea of, oh, these are some things that you have experienced. And I wonder how these are bleeding into the relationship now, especially if they've gone completely untreated up until this point. Um, so I have these two really good snapshots of these two people before they walk in. Um, and then a really interesting question for me to them is, what do you want to get out of this experience? because it's very telling to see exactly what they want to get out of this. Um, if I get the response of, well, because she told me that I had to, or that we were going to break up is sort of like, huh? Okay. Well, let's dig into like, what do you feel like your role is in this? How do you feel like you're accountable? It takes two to play. Yep. So there's two of you that are contributing to this right now. So how could you imagine that you are accountable for that? You know what I mean? Um, but if there's a little bit more vulnerability in there, a little bit more specificity about what they want to get out of this, that will lead me down, you know, a variety of lanes here of where, where we start. Mm -hmm. So if you have somebody that is, uh, let's just say, I mean, and I don't know these people, so he's accusing her of cheating and she's not like, what kinds of things after you have the discussion in your session, what kinds of things can she do to sort of reinforce during their everyday life that no, when I leave and I go see my sister, like I'm really going to see my sister or no, I'm not attracted to 12 year old boys. Like, it, it, you know, what kinds of things could she potentially do anything? I feel like that's a really tri tricky question. And I'm going to tell you why, whatever his distorted problematic thought process is, is not her responsibility. OK, yeah. so if she has not saying she has in this case, but let's say she's been unfaithful in the relationship multiple times. Yeah, she probably has given him a pretty decent reason to be suspicious then. Mm -hmm. Right. But if this has never been an issue, this has never come up. She's never done anything like that in the relationship. This is I hate to say it this way, but this is kind of his problem. It's his problem. You know, he's got a very distorted thought process that's happening here and he's projecting it onto her and making it her problem. So I don't really feel like it's her responsibility to change his mind or here's my location. Here's where I'm going. Here's where I'm going to come back. Do you want to look through my text messages? All of those behaviors can be incredibly toxic and very unhealthy. Looking through someone's phone when they don't have any knowledge of doing that is not healthy. I don't care if someone says, well, it makes me feel better when I don't see anything on there. It might right now, but at some point when you don't find anything, you're going to say, ooh, he must have a secret account somewhere. He might have another email address. I wonder if I go into this app, he's going to have messages in there. It's never going to be enough. Right. It's never going to be enough. It's a very, don't go down that road. If anyone out here is listening to that and you're already doing that and you're checking through your partner's phone without them knowing, stop. Don't do it. It's not going to do anything good for your relationship. If you still have suspicions or being unfaithful, go to counseling because it's not going to help you. It's not going to help your relationship to continue to do that. It's not sustainable. So going back to the question, if she is going about her business as usual and he still has an issue or is still accusing her of cheating, why? What behavior of hers has changed that's triggering that thought process? If there isn't anything, then it's him. If she has changed her behavior, then let's talk about that. You know what I mean? So if there have there been any behavioral changes between the two of them, is this brand new information? Is this a brand new accusation that's come up? Then let's find out what's what's contributing to it. Otherwise, I need to understand where is this coming from? Why do you have this, this concern? Has she given you a reason to be concerned before? What is your history in relationships? How many times have you stepped out of your relationships? How many times have you been cheated on? What were some of those indicators for you that that was happening? Is something that she's doing unconsciously triggering you? 
did you have a partner that would go to her sister's house to hang out for wine and snacks and was actually going to another guy's house? Like, tell me about your history with that. Mm -hmm. So this isn't about her, you know, walking on eggshells and going above and beyond to appease him or make him feel more comfortable if she's not already doing that already. Like if she's not already showing him love and affection and care and all of those things, you know what I mean? But mm, I do suspect that if this is a new accusation, this is coming from a place of him feeling very unstable mm. in the relationship. And he's grasping at some sort of straws to shame her, to shame her and make her feel guilty for his feelings so that she won't leave. Mm -hmm. Could the spending habits also show instability? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So these things you should kind feel of feel bad. You should feel bad because you're probably cheating on me. So I'm going to spend this money. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly what I was thinking. So you don't suggest walking through the door and being like, Hey honey, here's my phone. Go ahead, do your thing. Or randomly saying, Hey, you know, or I'm put a tracker on my, my car or whatever like that. You don't suggest. Absolutely that. not. Absolutely not. No, it's not going to go anywhere good. Mm -hmm. Totally agree. Anything else that you'd like to add either for this particular post to this mom or just in general about the, hey, does therapy, you know, is therapy going to work in this situation or do we head to divorce court? Anything else you'd like to share? I think that she's got to have a conversation with him and say, you know, from a very non-judgmental place, I feel like we've got, we've got some stuff to work through. I definitely feel like there's some miscommunications. There's um, some unclear boundaries between the two of us. I just feel like we need someone objective to help us sort through this stuff because I think we're at a point now um, where our relationship has become very unhealthy for the two of us. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to see um, how we can work that out. If he's completely unwilling, you can't control another person. Mm -hmm. You cannot control what another person does. Mm -hmm. I am not a huge fan of ultimatums, especially in relationships. Um, but in this particular situation, if he's unwilling to look at what his role is and see how he is being accountable in some of these relationship issues um, and wants to continue to make it about her, I don't think that that's something that she can move forward with in a very healthy way. It's going to require some work on both parts, um, but I would definitely recommend that she at least seek individual therapy for herself. I was just going to say that no matter what, I mean, I feel like absolutely everybody on the planet earth, whether their whole life was rainbows and butterflies or not, um, could use, uh, uh, somebody to talk to somebody mm -hmm. to, to share their thoughts with somebody to share their feelings with so that, you know, I mean, you learn so much when you talk with somebody that's, you know, educated and experienced in the industry that you're in, you just learn so much about yourself which is huge. You can't like, how can you come to into a relationship without having a, a great understanding of your own shit? You know what I mean? Or having your own shit together. Like how, how do you think you're going to arrive to that relationship? It's certainly yeah. not going to be at its best. Absolutely. And then you're just yeah. causing more chaos for yourself. So I've always said it. I mean, I feel like absolutely everybody has things going on. Everybody. I don't care who you are, what kind of family you grew up in, what kind of parents you have or didn't have. Everybody has stuff to deal with. And, you know, back in the day, and I think some of us are still old enough to remember this, but back in the day, therapy was like a swear word. Like you didn't do that because you were what? You were weak or you couldn't handle your own life or you were somehow divulging some sort of weakness about yourself. And honestly, I think that that is so far from the truth. It's not even funny. And I feel like you're actually showing strength and I feel like you're actually showing, you know what I mean? Like, like, Hey, I want to, I want to be the best me that I can be. Absolutely. And, Vulnerability and, is power. Very much. Yeah. It really is. And you know, to, to, to piggyback on what you just said too, Katie is there's, there's a, a big stigma even still in a lot of cultures regarding therapy, um, because it is an, an indicator that you could be, be bringing shame to your family. 
Mm. And shame and guilt are two of the most powerful motivators in the human condition. So um, when those things exist, it's very hard to do what you feel like would be healthy for you when you've had this really strong narrative of shame existing in your life. So it's still out there. Some cultures have it more than others, um, but vulnerability is 100% power if you can get yourself there. Absolutely. Totally agree. Well, Diana, it's always a pleasure. I love our monthly chat. I kind of feel like it's just me and you, although I do watch the comments to see what we got, see if we've got questions, but I kind of feel like, you know, you're sitting in my office and we're just having a chat. So just thank you for, chat. right. Like, thank you for how laid back and just awesome. This show is, I really appreciate it. If anybody in our audience would like to connect with you, maybe they've got some questions, maybe they want to do a consultation or just jump right in with you. How can they do that? Absolutely. So you can go to my website. It's dianaisaltherapy.com. Um, you can click on the upper right-hand corner to schedule a free 15-minute consultation if you would like. Um, otherwise, you can also just send me an email. It's diana at dianaisaltherapy.com. Super simple. Um, I'm super responsive that way, and I'll get right back to you, and we can chat. Awesome. And I will link your um, web address, too, in the show notes here. So it can be easily clicked on. And as always, ladies, while you're out there, if you're listening to Mom Nation Talk Radio right now, please do like, subscribe, follow us, get the notifications, download our episodes so that we can get this information out to the moms that really need to hear it. Because Diana knows she watches the Mom Nation feed. For, you, for those of you who might not be a part of the group, um, we are on Facebook. And for those of you who aren't in Arizona, our largest group is in Arizona, but for those of you who are not, check out momnationusa.com because we are in a couple of other states and you can absolutely connect with our resources and connect with wonderful people like Diana. Thank you Thank again. You. I appreciate it, Diana. Have a good one. Thank you. Bye. Bye.